Chapter Seven of Prodigal Daughters by Joseph Hawking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kate Fallis. Chapter Seven, Roderick Ravenscroft. About seven o'clock that evening, the doorbell rang, and Mrs. Trelawney sprang to her feet as if to leave the room. Where are you going, Alice? asked the colonel to open the door she replied but why because the servants have gone out at least the housemaid and parlourmaid have as for the cook she refuses to answer the doorbell but should you have allowed your help to go out when you expect people in to supper my dear i'm afraid you don't understand if i tried to keep them in they'd give notice immediately and if they left me i don't know where i should get others you see all right alice stay here i'll answer the door i expect it's only john and young davenport when the colonel opened the door however he found a stranger colonel trelawney queried the visitor that is my name excuse me for calling colonel but i took the liberty of paying a chance visit my name is ravenscroft roderick ravenscroft what not the son of my old friend dick ravenscroft yes sir i believe you and he were at school together come in my boy i'm awfully glad to see you this is splendid i was thinking about your father only yesterday and wondering where he was he settled in london just before the war sir as you may remember he practised law on the northern circuit and when he became a king's counsel he came to town we live in hampstead splendid then i shall soon be seeing him he'll be mighty glad to see you sir you are sure i shall not be in the way in the way certainly not of course you'll stay to supper my wife has just told me that the servants are out so you'll quite understand that things will have to be of a go-as-you-please order alice here's roderick ravenscroft son of my old friend dick ravenscroft who was at rugby with me the newcomer was a fine-looking young fellow tall well built and with clean-cut features he was good to look at a splendid specimen of a well-bred well-groomed young man good evening roderick said mrs trelawney greeting him as an old friend i'm so glad you've dropped in the children are out at present but i'm expecting them every minute you'll excuse me won't you but the servants are out and i want to look after supper let me help you mrs trelawney oh no there's not the slightest need i got nearly everything ready this afternoon but i may have forgotten something i dare say you understand all about it how does your mother get on with her servants for heaven's sake don't mention them laughed ravenscroft father and i have more than once had to get up and light the fires of a morning i believe mother's fairly fixed up now but there's no knowing how long it may last one left last month because she was asked to fetch coals from the cellar the gardener was ill so mother had to fetch them herself then of course you understand my housemaid and parlourmaid both threatened to leave if i wouldn't let them have all sunday afternoon and evening in which to visit their friends i told them how awkward it would be if any visitors came and they suggested that the visitors should prepare supper and wash up the dishes themselves good laughed ravenscroft i suppose that's what bernard shaw means by the dictatorship of the proletariat mrs trelawney left the room and left the two men together well what is your line of life 
asked the colonel excuse my asking but i take the liberty as an old friend of your father's i am glad you asked sir i am trying to follow my father i left oxford when i was twenty-two and soon after passed my exam for the bar then the war broke out and of course i joined up up to a few months ago i was in khaki when i got demobilized then i tried to settle down where i left off a sensible thing too but those five years must have been bad preparation for the law in a way i suppose they were on the other hand i think they have done me quite a lot of good they've helped me to understand men yes i suppose they have and you are doing well i hope i think i've made a good start sir and on the whole things are shaping all right it'll be pretty tough work but i fancy i'll pull through good i haven't had a chance of seeing my boy trev yet i've been so full up at the war office i've written telling him to try to get leave to come home but he writes saying he's afraid he'll have to go to ireland if he can't come home i must try and run down to plymouth this week as naturally i want to see him badly but john seems to be doing well john's a fine fellow said ravenscroft heartily i'm glad to hear you say that was the colonel's reply i've been greatly pleased with what i've seen of him and his mother tells me that he's been a great help to her a thoroughly straight dependable chap is john you'll find him very thoughtful and intelligent too have you made a friend of him yes in a way of course he's several years my junior but we've hit it very well i don't know whether mrs trelawney has told you sir but i've taken the liberty of calling here several times these last few months and ravenscroft flushed as he spoke that's right replied the colonel heartily i'm glad you have i have only just begun to realize what a hard lonely time my wife has had while i've been away i am sure she will have appreciated your visits the truth is stammered ravenscroft i i've been very much interested in coming i've been in rather a dilemma too you see your being away from home made everything very difficult i thought i ought to tell mrs trelawney and yet i was not sure then i heard you were coming home and i thought i'd wait the colonel looked at him intently i'm not sure i understand he said no i'm afraid i've put it badly to tell you the truth sir i'm in love with eleanor the colonel opened his eyes very wide i had no suspicion of such a thing he said my wife has not said a word about it no i've never told her sir i didn't feel as though i ought especially when i heard you were coming home but i felt that that you should know i did not want to come here under false pretenses but until i felt sure you'd approve of me i thought i'd no right to speak and yet i couldn't keep away from the house have you spoken to eleanor no sir not yet but i'm sure she knows my feelings and from the fact that she's always seemed glad to see me when i came i i kept on coming i hope you understand sir i wanted to do the straight thing i told my father about it and he seemed to think that as you were away from home and therefore could know nothing about me that i was in a difficulty but i thought i would come to-night in the hope of a few minutes chat alone i hope it's all right sir and the young fellow looked anxiously into the colonel's face let me understand replied the colonel from what i gather you have come to the house several times lately and that you've fallen in love with eleanor 
that's it sir this in eager tones but as i was away from home you didn't think it right to speak to her well sir i heard you'd be coming home shortly and my father thought i'd better wait till you came he made me feel that it would scarcely be the straight thing to become engaged to her that is assuming she liked me enough until you knew what kind of a fellow i was of course i could have asked mrs trelawney but that would have been different i didn't want to take advantage of your absence sir roderick ravenscroft appealed to the colonel strongly he reminded him of the old-fashioned courtesies which were dear to him and the honest outspoken frankness aroused his admiration of course i can quite understand that you'd like to know more about me before you said anything definite went on ravenscroft eagerly but i'm dead in earnest sir you know my people and i did fairly well during the war there are lots of people in hampstead who know me and can tell you what kind of fellow i am of course i shan't be in a position to marry for a year or so but but things are coming my way in fact i've a fairly big thing on hand now and and it's difficult to say sir but but i've kept straight and and i've never had any entanglements with girls or anything of that sort the colonel hesitated before speaking again as far as he could see ravenscroft was a fine young fellow he admired his manliness his simplicity and his old-fashioned courtesy but he was not quite sure of his ground he called to mind the scene in the treadmill a few hours before and he wondered whether ravenscroft had any inkling of eleanor's state of mind he wondered too whether he was fully aware of the kind of girl she was you say you have not spoken to eleanor that is so sir as i told you i did not think it right to speak in your absence especially as you were shortly coming home but i'm sure she knows and do you know much of her have you seen a great deal of her not as much as i should have liked as luck would have it my father has been able to put a good deal of work in my way and i've been very busy but i've come here whenever i could and i've taken her to amusements two or three times but you've never said anything definite you've never asked her to become engaged to you no sir i've told you why and have you reason to think she would say yes i hope so sir of course i'm not sure and and sometimes i've not quite been able to understand her but i'm in dead earnest and i thought i ought to tell you i wanted to come here very much but i thought it was your right to know why i came i appreciate your candour and your sincerity replied the colonel and i am sure you are a worthy son of my old friend but as you may imagine this is all very strange to me when i left home eleanor was only a child and i cannot accustom myself to the idea that she is now twenty-one besides i've hardly had time to look around and understand my bearings i came home only last monday and i've been from early to late at the war office and the foreign office ever since that means that i've hardly had time to make the acquaintance of my own children but let me say this at once i shall be glad to see you here whenever you care to come as for speaking to eleanor i think you'd better let it stand over for a time i'm saying that because well for one thing although you are the son of my old friend i don't know you mind i like what i've seen of you and if eleanor reciprocates your feelings i feel sure anyhow let matters take their own course for a bit and and i shall be delighted to welcome you whenever you care to pay a visit to the house ah surely that's john's voice hello a rod old man 
cried john who entered the room just then i'm glad to see you you know davenport don't you rather replied ravenscroft we were together in the montidier show and he shook hands with the man john had brought with him oh don't rub in that laughed john rub in what the fact that davenport was in at the finish he's always crowing over me about it he seems to think because i fagged for him at rugby that he has the right to assume superior airs but i can't help not being born two or three years before i tried hard enough to get out the army is no place for children john my boy said davenport very solemnly i say dad cried john please forgive me this is davenport whom i told you about i hope you'll take him in hand he's not quite so bad as he looks and if you treat him kindly he may in time turn out quite all right his people are quite intelligent too the colonel liked davenport and he saw at a glance that he was one of his own sort he had a sense of humour too and the colonel soon found himself hugely enjoying a wordy combat that went on between the three young men this was something like what he hoped his home would be he was far from being an old man and the sound of young voices was pleasant to his ears he began to hope that after all things with eleanor and peggy were not so bad as he feared he reflected that they were only children and in spite of the fact that they had become infected with thoughts that were repugnant to him he would be able by wise management to lead them into better ways of course ravencroft's confession came to him rather as a shock but as he watched the young man's face he almost hoped that eleanor would fall in love with him if she had not already done so to say the least of it he was a fine fellow and would be a husband of whom any girl might be proud but did ravenscroft really know the kind of girl eleanor was and was he aware of peggy's infatuation with the fellow barnes the thing was not pleasant to think about and he looked forward with anything but pleasant anticipation to his coming from what his wife had told him he was a flashy underbred sort of chap who had taken advantage of peggy's foolishness and established himself as a kind of fiance of his daughter if this were so and assuming that eleanor was fond of ravenscroft there might be unpleasant complications he could see at a glance that ravenscroft was a gentleman and if barnes were what he suspected he would naturally resent any association with him the colonel almost wished he had not consented to peggy bringing him that night in a way it might be taken as a kind of consent on his part to barnes being received as a probable son-in-law at any rate he must make the best of it and be guided by developments the part he had to play was anything but pleasant and one which he had never dreamt of for upon one thing he had fully determined if barnes proved to be the kind of fellow he feared he was he would certainly put an end to his friendship with peggy and forbid his having any further connection with the family a little later voices were heard in the hall and the colonel judged by the flush on ravenscroft's face that he had heard eleanor speaking in this he proved to be right for at that moment eleanor entered accompanied by a woman of from twenty-eight to thirty years of age i hope i'm not intruding colonel this lady said after eleanor had presented her as miss tamson corey on the other hand replied the colonel i hope i shall always have pleasure in welcoming my children's friends miss corey was not slow to recognize the non-committal nature of this remark but not being a lady of a very sensitive nature 
and also being deceived by the colonel's courteous tones had no suspicion of his real thoughts concerning her i hear you've been away a number of years she ventured yes yeah, six and kind of out of the world too i suppose yes if you can call india and mesopotamia out of the world well i do in a way although i hear the people of india are waking up from what i can gather the old order of things has passed away even there i shouldn't be surprised if we lose our indian empire and a good thing too and why asked the colonel it shows the movements of the age it shows that the old bad past has come to an end why should a little island like england govern a huge peninsula like india i believe in self-determination for all peoples and races in relation to government indeed yes all the thought of the age is in that direction individually and nationally the world has been in swaddling clothes too long no real progress is possible without absolute freedom to live our own lives both nationally and individually don't you think so i'm not sure i quite understand you replied the colonel i dare say not you see you've been out of it for several years yes i've been doing my best to help in the government of races who don't know how to govern themselves but i say eleanor i haven't seen your mother yet i hope she's well i'm sorry said eleanor but i think mother will be waiting for peggy i can't think where she is she promised to be here by half past seven ah here she is the colonel glanced towards the door as his daughter spoke as she had said peggy entered at that moment accompanied by a young man End of chapter seven chapter eight of prodigal daughters by joseph hawking this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kate Fallis. Chapter 8. The Supper Party. Barnes had evidently dressed for the occasion. His clothes were carefully pressed, and his detachable cuffs were pulled to the right position over his hands. He wore a ring on each hand, and an imitation pearl in his tie-pin a coloured silk handkerchief protruded from the breast pocket of his jacket and he had taken great care that what he considered a sufficient quantity of it should appear his black hair had been abundantly greased and was brushed back from his forehead in the most approved fashion the colonel gave him a rapid glance and then moved towards him at any rate the man was under his roof as his guest and he could do no other than be courteous this is jim said peggy a little defiantly jim queried the colonel yes jim barnes it would seem that peggy had received instructions as to the manner of introduction mr barnes how do you do mr barnes proud to meet you colonel i hope you are well sir yes i'm very well thank you of course i've heard a good deal about you sir as doubtless you've heard a good deal about me i'm afraid you have the advantage of me there mr barnes replied the colonel but supper is ready shall we go into the dining-room now this is just what i like remarked barnes when they had taken their seats just a homely sort of meal personally i don't believe in dressing for dinner on a sunday night i'm old-fashioned i am dinner in the middle of the day on sunday i say and cold beef and pickles for supper no dress clothes and no servants bothering around there was dead silence at this 
for the moment peggy was too nervous to talk and it might seem that barnes did not appeal much to the others but he was not to be suppressed by silence and he determined to be much in evidence how are you getting on old thing he continued turning to john is the motor trade going hot were you speaking to me mr barnes asked john innocently of course i was you are the motor expert aren't you i suppose i shall see you sporting a rolls royce soon no mr barnes i don't know whether you are aware of it but the rolls royce is a very expensive car and i am very poor oh but that's no obstacle hosts of people get cars on the hire system it's the same with furniture i dare say you've seen ads about it isn't that so ravenscroft i really never noticed replied ravenscroft i was never well enough off to afford motor cars come off the roof old bean laughed barnes and don't think you can kid yours truly ravenscroft did not reply to tell the truth he was surprised to see a man of the barnes order sitting at the colonel's table although he took no apparent notice he looked towards eleanor but she was busy talking with her friend tamsin corey and did not seem to be listening to what barnes was saying as for that gentleman although he continued to talk freely he could not help feeling that he was not making a good impression to his surprise his sallies did not meet with the approval he expected and he could not quite understand the look on the colonel's face still he felt quite sure of himself he reflected that he was not only the best dressed but the best-looking man in the room and he had a sense of exhilaration that he was sitting at colonel trelawney's table with that gentleman's consent i suppose you find things a lot changed in england colonel he went on presently changed how well i say for the better although it's a debatable question but there it is a man is valued for what he's worth in these days the spirit of democracy is abroad why one of the biggest guns in the army was once a golf caddy there are some who object to the idea but all honour to him i say still i don't understand you no well i suppose that in the old days a man couldn't be an officer unless he was a bit of a swell but the war has knocked all that to smithereens not but what we've gone a bit too far i say that tommy atkins would rather serve under a gentleman than under one of his own class therefore although i am liberal in my opinions i say we ought to stick to the old spirit which made the saying an officer and a gentleman the first ought to always mean the last don't you think so colonel certainly replied the colonel but what constitutes a gentleman mr barnes that's a bit of a poser colonel you've got me below the belt still although there are no airs about me i believe in old lord salisbury he used to say that a gentleman always wanted to dress for dinner there's something in it you know not but what i prefer this kind of thing on a sunday night it may not be so classy as a regular dinner but it's more homely but as a regular thing a gentleman likes to dress and that constitutes a gentleman in a way it does don't you think so of course there are other things i'm going to get a job as a waiter right away laughed davenport want a you old sport laughed barnes but look here davy you know i'm right in the main chivalry to women might also be regarded as a mark of a gentleman remarked miss tamsin corey glad to hear you say that tamsin replied barnes be always polite to the ladies is my motto but isn't that a bit off your track i don't see why 
because you claim absolute equality between the sexes be straight now if women are the equals of men why should men treat women differently from what they treat men one thing has struck me since my return home put in the colonel in the old days a gentleman always felt it his duty to be polite to the ladies but that seems to have altered i've noticed it in the subways which are terribly crowded just now men will keep their seats and let women stand there may be more than one reason for that colonel remarked ravenscroft tell me what you mean rod my boy rejoined the colonel ravenscroft flushed with pleasure at hearing the colonel speak to him in such a friendly way it's just this sir he replied in the early days of the war all the conveyances got terribly crowded and then it was the exception for a man to sit while a woman was standing men practically always gave up their seats to women now i know it's different but haven't women themselves to blame how's that well for one thing what men gladly gave them as a courtesy women claimed as a right that put men's backs up but that's not all i think men respect women less than they did how why because women have become less womanly i think it's the natural instinct of every decent man to honour women as women but when they hear women swearing when they see them young girls especially smoking and drinking in public places when they hear them discussing delicate questions without a suggestion of womanly reserve when in short they see them losing their modesty men naturally refuse to pay homage to them that's all bunk remarked tamson cory of course you know the present-day young woman better than i do retorted ravenscroft but that's how it strikes me then don't you believe in the advancement of women depends what you mean by advancement i mean this women of your jane austen type was a backboneless simpering miss who was flabby bloodless without an opinion of her own her business was to get a husband and when she'd got him it was her duty to be the chattel of the man to breed children to look after the house and to be her husband's slave generally what i mean by women's advancement is that she should be the man's equal in every respect that she should be free to live her own life that she should choose whether she'll have children or not and be free to do all that a man does why should a woman be a man's slave why shouldn't she have exactly the same liberty a man has why should it be thought immodest for a woman to propose to a man and why should she be tied down to the moral code which men have set up for women while they have their fling exactly replied ravenscroft that's why men are ceasing to pay homage to women then women can do very well without men's homage as you call it for my own part i demand freedom to live my own life in my own way and every other woman of spirit demands to do the same i think your question as to the reason why men don't feel called upon to give up their seats for women as they did years ago is answered colonel laughed ravenscroft the colonel was silent during tamson cory's long speech he had been looking at eleanor and peggy noting the eager look on their faces tamson is fair on it to-night isn't she remarked barnes go to it tammy old girl i play the winner oh i know my views don't suit a certain class of men retorted tamson but i put it to you mr ravenscroft suppose you were born a woman how would you like your liberties restricted how would you like to have to play second fiddle to men how would you like to have to recognize one standard for men and another for women 
how would you like to be man's obedient slave don't you think women are equal to men i think that the almighty meant them to be superior replied ravenscroft and oh save us from any pious piffle interrupted tamson i think the almighty meant them to be superior to men repeated ravenscroft only women are giving up their superiority in order to gain equality not all i'm glad to think there are still a number who realize wherein a woman's true power lies but there's a new spirit in the age and that spirit doesn't improve women but look here cried tamson eager for battle what would you have women be you talked just now about girls smoking and drinking in public places why shouldn't they if they want men do men swear if they want to why shouldn't women would you have young girls think that babies are found under gooseberry bushes why shouldn't they know all there is to be known why shouldn't they talk about the facts of life whatever they are freely and frankly and if they feel any law or custom is wrong whether it's moral or physical why shouldn't they break them you think they should i imagine certainly i do why shouldn't they if they want are we to be tied down to such worn-out superstitions as marriage and all sorts of cramping paralyzing codes of propriety and morals then you believe in absolute liberty for women i believe in exactly the same liberty for a woman as for a man a father gives his son a latch-key why shouldn't he give one to his daughter a young fellow goes to a public dance without a chaperone why shouldn't a girl a young fellow has his fling why shouldn't his sister if he has one have the same liberty buck up old bean cried barnes as ravenscroft hesitated before replying tammy has scored on you up to now go in for the respectable side roddy and trot out your arguments an angry flush mounted ravenscroft's cheeks he resented barnes's impertinence and felt like snubbing him he glanced at the colonel and wondered what he thought of the conversation to say the least of it it seemed strange that he should allow such sentiments expressed in his house and he wondered if he ravenscroft would be within the bounds of good taste to continue the conversation he judged by the look in the colonel's eyes however that he wished him to answer tamson so while he was anything but comfortable he determined to go on it's not altogether a matter of argument mr barnes he said with a slight emphasis on the mister it's also a question of good taste for example i was in the smoking-room of a golf club the other day and a girl about twenty came in she threw herself in an armchair crossed her legs which were freely exposed took out a cigarette lit it and then ordered a liquor the waiter was rather long in bringing it and when he did appear she asked him with the aid of some swear words what he'd been so long about well what's wrong about that asked tamson you'd have thought nothing of a man doing it i don't know about that replied ravenscroft but i do know that it didn't give me a very high opinion of the girl even though you may claim it was not wrong it seemed to me in very bad taste some of the men who were there winked at each other others lifted their eyebrows after all there's such a thing as womanliness but what about unwomanly what's wrong in a cigarette i'm hoping to smoke a few after supper what's wrong in a liquor men have it and if a man swears at a stupid waiter why shouldn't a girl at any rate it goes to show why men are losing their honour for women replied ravenscroft but surely 
interrupted the colonel you are not serious in what you have just said such things were not dreamt of ten years ago that is among nice girls oh it's not at all uncommon replied ravenscroft a new spirit has come into the age and girls laugh at things which years ago would have shocked them i suppose i have old-fashioned tastes but think of the dances which are all the rage think too of the way girls dress or don't dress we may laugh at old ideas but the modern young woman doesn't help one to despise those ideas noah and the ark are more in your line rod laughed peggy personally said the colonel i find rod's views very much to my way of thinking but surely colonel burst in tamsin cory you are not serious you are a man of the world and you can't agree with that tosh i'm mortally sure i do well i'm damned muttered tamsin under her breath it's not only that interposed mrs trelawney there seems to be a different standard of morals from what there was especially among young girls it's seen among them in every class some time ago i got a new servant after she had been with me three days she took her night out i told her i expected her home at half past ten she didn't say anything but went out half past ten came then half past eleven and she did not appear i went to bed the following morning when she returned i took her to task but she refused to tell me where she had been or what she had been doing in fact she resented my inquiring into what she called her private affairs of course that's a bit strong said tamsin but we shall have to adapt our ideas that's all i'll give up housekeeping first was mrs trelawney's retort the fact is went on tamsin we may as well settle it first as last that the old order of things is dead there is a new spirit in the air as ravenscroft has said for my own part i think it is good think of the old ideas about marriage when a woman got married she promised to stay with one man and keep only to him till death but it's against human nature so why not away with such exploded fallacies personally if the institution of marriage is to continue at all i would have divorce made easy but there perhaps i am treading on delicate ground i think you are replied the colonel somewhat grimly all the same such things will have to be faced went on tamsin i'm pretty moderate myself but revolution is in the air the old cruel unnatural bandages are being snapped superstitious religions and otherwise are being exploded have we all finished asked the colonel if so i'll return thanks and then we'll go into the lounge two hours later the colonel saw his guest to the door it was easy to see that he was annoyed and yet curiously interested in many respects the evening had been a revelation to him and he was more perturbed than he had been since his return his eyes had become hard his features set no don't go to bed yet he said to eleanor and peggy who were preparing to leave the room why have you anything to say to us asked eleanor yes i have end of chapter eight chapter nine of prodigal daughters by joseph hawking this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kate Fallis. Chapter 9 I'm Engaged to Jim. Am I to understand, said the Colonel, turning to Peggy, that any love passages have passed between you and this man Barnes? Well, what if there have? I'm asking a question. Yes i'm engaged to jim cried peggy defiantly 
without my knowledge or consent how could i get that when you were away without your mother's consent then mother knew i was fond of him i've done nothing sneaky i brought him home i told mother what i meant to do and do you really mean to tell me that you've engaged yourself to him i've promised i'll marry him yes you a child of eighteen what's that to do with it i'm old enough to know my own mind i'm not a kid i know what's what then my consent doesn't count i don't see why it should if i like him very well i see where we stand now then i want to say this i absolutely forbid you to have any further associations with him in any form you mean to say that you forbid him to come here absolutely why what has he done besides i don't care what you say i'm fond of jim and i shall marry him not with my consent why what have you against him i've everything against him he isn't a gentleman he's just a common bounder he's nothing of the sort he's as good as your pattern boy there he's better looking he's more of a gentleman and and i don't care what you say now peggy let there be no misunderstanding i allowed you to bring him here to-night because of what you said about him and because of what your mother told me i decided to see him and judge for myself well i have seen him i've listened to him i've watched his face i've summed up his character and i've made up my mind about him why can't you see the kind of fellow he is don't your own instincts help you to see that he has nothing in common with us that's pure snobbery cried peggy in a rage i can see what you've got against him you say he isn't a gentleman you are a snob that's what you are just a snob isn't a real estate agent just as good as a motor mechanic and that's what your own son is he was an officer in the army just as you are yourself his business or his profession has nothing to do with my judgment of him replied the colonel i don't object to him because of his evident lack of education or even of good manners although those things are important but he's common by instinct he's a common bounder to the heart's core and more than that he's not a good chap i tell you this much as i might have been grieved if you had told me you were fond of a bricklayer a plumber or any sort of mechanic and i found him to be clean-minded and had the instincts of a gentleman i wouldn't have minded so much i don't say i shouldn't have tried to dissuade you i probably should in any case i should have insisted on your waiting a year or two until you were old enough to form a judgment but i wouldn't have met you with a non possumus but this fellow has not the suggestion of a gentleman he's vulgar through and through and more than that he's without manliness or principle he hasn't right feelings he's good enough for me anyhow defied peggy i hope not i sincerely hope not replied the colonel anyhow my mind's made up and so is mine you mean to disobey me yes if you won't give your consent to my marrying jim i shall marry him without the colonel was on the point of speaking angrily but he restrained himself he had for hours been suffering keenly and his nerves were getting raw but he realized that perhaps the whole future of his children's lives hung in the balance and he was anxious that no hasty word of his should be thrown in the wrong scale peggy my dear he said i am not saying this so much for my sake as for yours if you were to do as you say you will regret it within six months i tell you he's a bad fellow 
i don't want a plaster of paris saint besides i don't believe what people say about him you've been listening to a lot of gossip i've been listening to nothing and i know nothing but what i've seen and heard for myself that however is enough for me i forbid him to come to the house i forbid you to have anything to do with him if he comes here again i shall show him the door if you do i shall go to him i sincerely hope not if you do you go to your own ruin in spite of her turbulent spirit peggy was for the moment silenced there was something not only in her father's words but in his presence that made her afraid a great dread came into her heart that he spoke the truth do you mean to lock me in my room and feed me on bread and water she asked sullenly it might be doing you a kindness if i did replied the colonel but i'm not that kind of man still i've decided on my course of action i absolutely forbid you having anything more to say to barnes then i shall take my own course not if i can prevent it but what will you do that depends peggy turned to john with passionate flashing eyes you sneak you tell-tale you pious prig she cried i owe this to you you've been telling lies about jim because your fine friend sneered at him you've you've please stop interrupted the colonel john has told me nothing about this fellow barnes not one word now i think i've said enough you understand exactly how things stand you'd better go to bed now and think over what i have said perhaps you'll see in the morning that i've taken the right course no i shan't if you've made up your mind i've made up mine jim's as good as we are besides he's not a bit worse than others i've nothing to do with that ordinarily i shouldn't give such a fellow a second thought except to say that if he's a type of the young men of his class we're in a bad way it's only when he threatens to ruin my child's life that i take notice of him but why do you throw all your high-flown fireworks at me i'm sure jim's not nearly so advanced as thames and cory and you've not said a word about her and she's one of eleanor's bosom friends the colonel hesitated a second i'm awfully sorry that on this my first sunday night at home all this has happened he said but if i have said nothing to her it is only because i wanted to clear this barnes business out of the way first my objection to miss tamson cory as eleanor's friend is just as strong as my objection to barnes as your fiance a silence followed the colonel's remarks a silence that was painful presently mrs trelawney gave a long quivering sigh as though she dreaded what would come next john looked from one face to another as if calculating what the upshot would be while peggy for the moment cowed seemed to be wondering what to say possibly she might have yielded to her father's personality had she been alone but during the whole conversation she was influenced by the fact that eleanor was by her side and that she would support her i suppose then replied eleanor frigidly that tamson is also forbidden the sacred precincts of this august establishment yes i refuse to have her here might one ask why for the same reason that i would refuse the admission of one suffering from smallpox that is unjust tamson is a pure-minded woman she may be unconventional she naturally refuses to be tied down to foolish superstitions but i am proud to call her my friend i suppose the sanctity of marriage is one of the things she classes under the head of foolish superstitions possibly she would be regarded as having liberal ideas on that question liberal ideas 
and the colonel's voice had an angry ring in it the woman actually had the audacity to tell me that she regarded marriage as an effete institution and that according to her ideas any woman had the right to have children without paying any attention to marriage laws personally i do not support her in all her views all the same i am sure she has good reasons for holding them the colonel was for a few seconds speechless with indignation that his daughter a girl of twenty-one years of age should have such ideas was almost more than he could bear really father went on eleanor i think you are entirely unreasonable such questions are in the air and will have to be faced you do not seem to realize that we live in a new age and that people are thinking out the problems of life for themselves and might one ask whether you favor this woman's so-called liberal ideas on marriage i oh i hate the idea of marriage to me it is detestable that's why i think peggy is a fool to be fond of jim barnes but that's her affair each person must do what he or she thinks best no one has the right to interfere in another's conduct of his or her own life she spoke with perfect calmness and although her tremulous lips and quivering fingers showed that she was much excited she was able to control her voice perfectly i suppose these are the thoughts you have imbibed from your friends asked the colonel i don't know who i got them from neither does it seem to me that it matters but i claim the right to think for myself and act for myself then i suppose your mother and i don't count eleanor was silent anyhow went on the colonel i absolutely forbid such friendships as that of this woman i will not have her or her sort here perhaps you remember the old saying about mahomet and the mountain replied eleanor coolly is that a threat perhaps it is oh please please don't quarrel cried mrs trelawney eleanor can't you see how foolish how unfilial you are i have no wish to quarrel replied eleanor it is so vulgar then you refuse to obey me asked the colonel call it what you like replied the girl have you anything more to say i'm rather tired and such scenes as this bore me without another word she rose and left the room followed by peggy the colonel watching them with sad eyes oh what shall we do wailed mrs trelawney you can't drive them out of the house darling think what might become of them if you did and after all they are only children the colonel did not speak he felt that he had come to an impasse he dreaded the thought of them leaving home and yet that was doubtless what they had in their minds if he did not yield to their way of thinking peggy he thought he understood but eleanor was a problem that baffled him entirely i must go to them i really must cried mrs trelawney this is really worse than i thought i hoped oh i did hope that when you came home you'd put matters right but they seem worse than ever mayn't i tell them that you'll take time to consider or or something of that sort no replied the colonel but i may go to them mayn't i that goes without saying alice they are your children as much as they are mine but please don't lead them to think i shall yield in this matter but i want to tell them that you are acting for their good and that that you love them i think they know that they must know it all the same no child of mine shall have her life ruined by such a fellow as barnes if i can help it while that woman cory's thoughts are just poison but what if they persist darling 
you see how headstrong they are and really i don't see what you can do nor can i at present mrs trelawney gave him a despairing look and left the room while john looked at his father wonderingly john my boy come into my study with me will you john followed his father into the den without a word he wondered why he wanted him this is a bad business my boy said the colonel as he lit his pipe i'm awfully sorry it should have happened but i don't think i could have helped it no dad i don't think you could i feel rather lonely rather helpless and very sad went on the colonel i had looked forward to a different homecoming i naturally thought too that my girl's friends would be such as i could gladly welcome just as i welcome ravenscroft and davenport those are good chaps john and i'm glad you know them i shall always be pleased to see them here john flushed with pleasure as his mother had said he had become something of a hero worshipper and the boy's heart had gone out to his father my boy continued the colonel i want your help in what way dad i don't understand it's difficult to tell you but you can see how i am situated those two girls are utterly turbulent utterly defiant they mean to go their own way altogether regardless of me and that will mean their ruin don't you think so with peggy assented john as for eleanor i don't know how don't you know she's a curious girl she was always very reserved and would never make a pal of me and peggy we used to hit it off very well till she took up with that fellow barnes it's this way went on john the war upset everything and mother got terribly bothered how it was the money business sir everything became twice as dear and and i'm afraid trev was extravagant mother didn't know what to do as you already know eleanor got a job in a government office and was earning good money she's very clever she learned to do things like magic but she didn't bring much money home that was why i got a job mr davenport took me on and and said i was very useful then peg insisted on leaving school and working at a munition factory that i think led to everything else in what way there was a curious lot of people at these munition factories some of the girls were a bad lot and many of them were very common yes i had a pretty good idea about this replied the colonel but what made you think that although there might be danger for peggy you weren't sure about eleanor i don't know much about girls sir they are not much in my line i've been too busy about other things but peg's hot and passionate while eleanor's as cold as an icicle she calculates about everything she isn't like most girls excuse me sir but i accidentally heard a fellow talking about her one day and he described her as sexless that's why i i doubt whether there's any danger for her she's fond of dress and she goes her own way but men don't seem to have any attraction for her peg is all the other way the colonel was silent for a few seconds while john flushed a fiery red at his own speech do you know anything about barnes asked the colonel a common bounder cried john savagely i say dad i'm awfully sorry for you i did my best to help mother but girls are just awful in these days i went one night to one of these public dances jazz dances you know and the way some of the girls talked was simply awful you've no idea tell me what you mean my son remember that i was once a young fellow just as you are and can understand you oh i don't know that i came up against anything that you'd call absolutely wrong but 
but i danced with a girl who was living in a flat with two other girls she told me that they did this because their parents refused them latch keys and wouldn't allow them to live their own life as she called it they were supposed to be respectable girls and they'd all got jobs whereby they paid their own way she introduced me to the other girls afterwards and they invited me and two other fellows to take them home to their flat after the dance and did you go no sir i didn't i knew mother wouldn't like it i couldn't conceive of her doing such a thing when she was a girl thank god you couldn't ejaculated the colonel i don't think they they meant anything wrong sir stammered john but there you have it thousands of girls in london in order to live their own lives as they call it go off on their own and often from what i hear things turn out badly you mean that they go to the bad it would be a wonder if they didn't sir though of course there are lots of them who go perfectly straight i'd no idea things had gone so far muttered the colonel to himself oh it's quite common from what i hear rejoined john it may be all right to some girls but others pick up with bad fellows and and they lose their heads anyhow that's the kind of thing our girls are up against before you came home they did just what they liked with mother they frightened her by saying that if they didn't have their own way they'd leave home and so things just drifted peg picked up with barnes and eleanor got mixed up with creatures like tams and cory i didn't tell you at first sir i thought i might do harm but things are different now the colonel was silent a few seconds he believed that john boy though he was had given a pretty accurate diagnosis of the situation and it was a great comfort to him to feel that they were friends my boy he said laying his hand on john's arm you and i together must get the girls out of this tangle what can one do asked john of the practical mind can you find out all there is to know about barnes john's eyes flashed with quick intelligence i dare say i could sir but i'm afraid it would do no good you see peg doesn't care she laughs at what she calls copy-book morality and and doesn't it seem rather a melodramatic way of working the colonel saw what was going on in the boy's mind and realized that quiet and unostentatious as he was he had a quick brain and a keen intuition it was a great joy to the colonel to have such a son perhaps it is he admitted but i must save peg from marrying a fellow like that anyhow i can depend upon you to help me yes sir that goes without saying but no one knows what goes on in the mind of a girl like peg and barnes has infatuated her besides you are at the war office all day while i have to be at the works yes i know still you and i must work together my boy the next morning the colonel started for westminster before the girls appeared for breakfast john on the other hand had left the house soon after six neither eleanor nor peggy appeared till ten and then both of them refused to make any response to their mother's overtures in order to obtain their confidence about eleven o'clock both went out together and neither returned till late in the evening both refused to tell their mother where they had been tuesday was practically a repetition of monday on wednesday morning however something happened a letter from trevor arrived saying that he had been ordered to ireland and that if his father wished to see him he must come to plymouth immediately by the same post also the colonel received the following dear colonel 
peg has told me something which seems to me so outrageous that i am compelled to write asking you for an interview without delay unless i hear from you to the contrary i will do myself the honour of calling at your residence to-morrow wednesday evening about eight thirty any communication addressed to eight bywell street west and reaching there between the hours of nine and six will be delivered to your obedient servant james barnes the signature was ornamented by many flourishes end of chapter nine Chapter Ten of Prodigal Daughters by Joseph Hawking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kate Fallis. Chapter Ten: The Army and Navy Club Interview. At eleven o'clock the following morning, Mister James Barnes received the following note colonel trelawney cannot see mr barnes at hampstead but if he will be at the army and navy club at six thirty this evening he will endeavour to give him the interview he asks for short but to the point reflected mr barnes i thought i would make him sit up who's writing you from the war office barnes asked a fellow clerk who had handed him the letter and noticed the official stamp a private matter replied barnes with a superior air oh you needn't be so stuck on yourself anything to do with back pay well wilkins i wouldn't tell everybody replied barnes but it's a letter from the old man of my little bit of goods what colonel trelawney oh you know his name do you how these things leak out he's some swell i can tell you one of the oldest families in england and all that sort of thing i hear he's to be made general and that'll mean a baronetcy if not something bigger i've heard the trelawneys are big guns in their way but i'm told they've no dough to speak of the dough will be all right wilkins old man i'm not a bragging sort of chap but i can go as far as that is it all settled up then as good as settled do you mean to say that colonel trelawney has consented to your marrying his girl practically between you and me old man and this mustn't go any further this is a letter from the colonel inviting me to dine with him at the army and navy club to-night i expect we shall settle everything up then over a bottle of fizz likely story retorted the other you needn't believe me unless you like replied barnes but if you want to be convinced you can come with me to the door of the club you can't ask for a better proof than that can you wilkins was duly impressed he still had his doubts but as the envelope evidenced the fact that it came from the war office and as barnes spoke so confidently he concluded that there must be something in it i know i'm marrying a bit above me in a way admitted barnes but the colonel knows what's what i was up there to supper on sunday lots of swells there of course there was no chance to settle things then but he saw i wasn't the kind of chap to be sneezed at and he could see that his youngest girl was fair gone on me even yet wilkins was not quite convinced he was an open-eyed fellow and it did not seem at all right that a man of the barnes stamp would be received by colonel trelawney even although things were topsy-turvy and peggy was known to have been seen with him but before the day was out he had told several mutual friends what barnes had told him as that gentleman felt sure he would 
punctually at half past six barnes appeared at the door of the army and navy club he was rather disturbed about the question of dress and was not sure whether he ought not to have appeared in what he called his war paint but there was not time after six at which hour his office closed for him to get to camden town and return by the time the colonel had mentioned so he had to make the best of his office attire and try to assure himself that he was as good as the best of them still he felt very uncomfortable as he stood at the club door never once in spite of his best endeavours had he been admitted within its portals it is true he had had a nodding acquaintance with men who were members there but they had always treated him very distantly and never spoke to him except on purely military matters that was why although he determined as he put it to stand no lip from any one he felt rather awed he therefore passed into the club and made his way to an official is colonel trelawney here he asked the man gave him a quick glance what name he asked barnes pulled out a card and gave it to him you give him back my man he said condescendingly the colonel's a friend of mine i have an appointment with him will you come this way he said to barnes a few minutes later barnes followed the man upstairs and presently found himself in what he took to be a private room where the colonel sat alone you said you wished to see me remarked the colonel as soon as the club servant had gone barnes was taken aback at the colonel's peremptory manner it might be that he was back in the army again and that he had to appear before his c o on account of some delinquency still he determined to carry out the plan of action on which he had decided my word colonel you do yourself very well here he remarked pleasantly this is a nice club and no mistake of course it's not as fine a building as the old national liberal where a man i know used to be a member still it's more classy the colonel did not speak he determined to give him no help whatever i've often heard of this place went on barnes although i was not long enough in the army to get elected a member but i've been told a great deal about it i heard one man say that you could get the best whisky in london here he can't refuse to order a drink after that he reflected and then we shall get on a friendly footing but the colonel ordered no whisky he stood in silence waiting for his visitor to state his business do you mind my sitting down persisted barnes i've had a fairly busy day and feel a bit leggy you wrote saying you wished to see me mr barnes was the colonel's response as i have another appointment shortly i shall be glad if you'll state your business at once barnes felt he was not getting on his program was being destroyed at the outset and he felt at a loss what to say well colonel he stammered when i saw peg on monday night i i beg your pardon interrupted the colonel when you saw whom peg repeated barnes when i saw peg your daughter you know since when have i given you permission to call my daughter by a name only used by her family asked the colonel coldly come now colonel replied barnes that's coming it a bit too strong you know as well as i that we've been sweet on each other for months you invited me to come to your house on sunday night in a friendly way for a bit of supper and i came everything as i thought passed off all right 
and i quite thought that everything would be settled up between us but when peg told me you wouldn't have me at your house again in fact when she told me that you had put the kibosh on everything i felt that i could do no other than demand to have it out with you to have it out with me repeated the colonel yes to talk it over quietly as man to man i don't want any unpleasantness colonel but i tell you straight i'm not the kind of fellow who can take a thing like that lying down this is not an army matter this isn't and you can't come the high horse over me i don't understand your figures of speech mr barnes will you tell me exactly what you wish to say i've told you straight what i mean i'm sweet on peg and i'm not ashamed of it we've been going out together for some time and my people are ready to receive her as i said before i accepted your invitation to supper on sunday in a friendly spirit but i'm not going to stand being insulted being insulted yes insulted come off the roof and talk it out as man to man that's what i say you told peg that you wouldn't have me at the house again you told her that she must chuck me well i'm not going to stand being chucked see i've got my feelings and i'm prepared to marry her fair and square in a perfectly honourable way that's me let me understand said the colonel you wish to ask my consent to your being engaged to my daughter is that it well in a way it is replied barnes i shouldn't put it like that myself for peg and i have fixed it up between us personally i don't want any flimflam but since you put it that way let it be so thank you replied the colonel but while i appreciate the honour of your proposal i cannot give my consent for a moment barnes was nonplussed he felt that somehow he was making no progress with the man who met all his overtures with cold cutting politeness at any rate i have a right to ask your reasons for saying that he blustered perhaps so mr barnes but i do not propose to give them please understand however that all intimacy all connections of whatever sort between you and any member of my family must cease look here cried barnes in a rage i've asked straight i have if you had some chaps to deal with seeing how sweet peg is on me there there might have been a different story to tell but i'm doing the honourable thing and i'm damned if pardon me mr barnes interrupted the colonel but this is a gentleman's club and if you don't moderate both your manner and your speech i shall be obliged to ring for a servant and have you shown out you mean to say that you meet me with a direct refusal then absolutely please understand that why how are you better than i am in which way is peg superior to me pardon me mr barnes i have claimed no superiority i simply state that i do not consent to your proposal the colonel's quiet tones helped barnes to control himself he was not so much in love with peggy that he did not see the true issues of the case if he married her without the colonel's consent he would gain very little advantage by the marriage he might boast as much as he liked but he would continue to be an outsider and he would never have such another chance to get a foothold into what he termed an aristocratic family look here colonel he cried eagerly i hope i understand a gentleman's feelings you've only been home a week and this has come upon you a bit sudden-like 
i'm in no such hurry as all that i'm willing to let the matter stand over for a bit say a year and if at the end of that time we are both of the same mind will you consent then there you can't say that isn't fair for a moment the colonel was tempted could he not settle the matter on these lines could he not insist on a two years probation during which time the two were not to meet or correspond in any way he felt sure that by the end of that time peggy would have gotten over her infatuation and the whole thing would die a natural death he was almost on the point of making such a suggestion when he gave barnes another look over no he could not in spite of the fellow's good looks and fine physique he was a vulgar ill-bred common bounder he could not temporize with him besides the colonel had throughout all the years of his responsible life held to the rule that delay and temporization were a sign of weakness it only meant the postponement of an evil day and was an unworthy method for a strong man let's get the thing settled and out of the way once and for all he had said again and again concerning awkward things which had cropped up in the pathway of his life indeed this had become a fixed principle of his life that was why although it might seem sound policy to play for time just now he could not do it it would not be honourable neither in two nor in twenty years could he see himself consenting to any kind of intimacy end of chapter ten chapter eleven of prodigal daughters by joseph hawking this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by kate fallis chapter eleven unacceptable advice while mr james barnes was making his way towards the station eleanor trelawney was climbing the hill which led from the station to her father's house usually calm and cold the girl was much excited during the day she had had conversation with miss tamson corey and one or two others of the same ilk and afterwards had taken a step which was destined to prove very important in her life's history she had often boasted to herself that she seldom acted on impulse but submitted everything to the cold test of reason but it might appear just at present that she was untrue to this boast even as she walked across the heath her lips were tremulous while in her eyes was a look which suggested apprehension if not fear miss trelawney she gave a start as if caught in some guilty act but a moment later a look of relief passed across her face i saw you leaving the station and took the liberty of following you you don't mind do you it was roderick ravenscroft who spoke and from the earnest look he gave her it might appear that he had something important in his mind the heath is not private property was her laughing reply no thank goodness are you on your way home i suppose so does that mean that you are in no hurry well why should you be it's a beautiful evening and spring is showing everywhere will you let me walk with you eleanor assented almost eagerly there was a kind of calm strength in ravenscroft's presence and although she had more than once spoken of him as awfully conventional she rather admired him indeed although she had never confessed it even to herself 
she had more than an ordinary interest in him instead of going straight towards her home they turned into a path which led to the less frequented parts of the heath i hope you are all right at home miss trelawney said ravenscroft rather awkwardly after they had gone a few steps together i don't think any one's there except mother was her answer i don't know where peg is and father and john left the house early this morning yes of course your father'll be at the war office as you know i met him for the first time on sunday and and i say you must be awfully proud of him why why i think he's one of the grandest men i ever met just the perfect specimen of an english officer who is also an english gentleman i thought you seemed very struck by him i was it isn't often one meets such a man if i'd remained in the army i'd have given anything to serve under him by jove he's the kind of man for whom his men will go anywhere or do anything i've been hearing to-day of his work in the east and how by his coolness his courage and his iron will he's carried through some terribly difficult jobs do you admire these iron-willed men yes when they are like he is you see he's so kind and reasonable and never expects or asks for anything but what is right eleanor was silent he's always so courteous too i couldn't help noticing it on sunday no matter how much he abominated miss cory's views and i'm positive he did he seemed always to remember that she was a guest in his house eleanor grew slightly angry at this she remembered the conversation that took place afterwards do you know went on ravenscroft that i almost dreaded meeting him i had something to say to him and i dreaded how he would meet me and did you say what you wanted to say yes replied ravenscroft flushing somewhat shall i tell you what it was and did he meet you kindly she asked taking no notice of his question very kindly miss trelawney may i ask you something i can't keep you from asking anything you like can i and she felt her heart beating rapidly it's this said ravenscroft of course it's an awful liberty for me to take but i hope you won't mind you don't agree with that woman do you what woman miss cory of course i know such people exist and that such views as she holds are becoming very common but i do hope that that you hate them indeed he went on hurriedly i was rather surprised to see her there as your friend i know it's awfully cheeky on my part to say so but i can't help it and supposing i do oh but you couldn't you know no lady could ravenscroft had said more than he intended he was much excited at being alone with eleanor and in his excitement forgot himself he knew that miss cory had been at the trelawney home as eleanor's friend and could not quite understand it and yet he felt he had no right much as he desired it to condemn such a friendship then you do not class miss cory as a lady who could i could and do i'm awfully sorry i don't see what you've to be sorry about my friendships are rather a personal matter and i fail to see why any any she hesitated for a word outsider should interfere miss trelawney said ravenscroft eagerly i didn't mean to say this and yet i'm sure you must know i hope i'm not an outsider as far as your house is concerned i i very much want to to become one of you 
you must surely know that that's why that woman made me a bit angry had she been in some other house or some one else's friend i shouldn't have given her a second thought except to laugh at her ravenscroft was rather unfortunate in his remarks but he was excited he was not quite sure of his ground with eleanor and yet he was angry at the thought of her being the friend of such a woman as tamsin cory laugh at her indeed eleanor was irritated by his words although much that he said pleased her you laugh at tamsin cory why she's one of the most intellectual women i know i'm sorry you know her at all interjected ravenscroft making another unpolitic move i fail to see why replied his companion coldly indeed i do not understand what you have to do with my friendships aren't you taking a great deal upon yourself i'm afraid i am admitted ravenscroft but surely you know why i'm so so interested in you that i hate to see you in the society of such a woman surely you don't agree with her surely you don't accept her ideas about about morality they are not decent you know really mr ravenscroft i've no recollection of ever giving you permission to discuss my closest friends with me as to what views i hold i rather think that is purely a personal matter i know i'm awfully rude persisted ravenscroft and i can't forgive myself for angering you but but i say miss trelawney have i made a mistake i i he was tremendously excited i had hoped sincerely hoped passionately hoped that although our acquaintance has not been a very long one you cared enough for me to allow me to speak freely about such things such things as what such things as as friendships replied ravenscroft vainly trying to lead the conversation into the channel he desired then i'm afraid you have made a mistake replied eleanor coldly i should never think of allowing any one any one to interfere with my friendships to say nothing of of a casual visitor to my father's house but surely said ravenscroft still floundering your father does not favour your your intimacy with that woman i beg your pardon but i refuse to discuss my father's wishes i'm sure i apologize said roderick who was also getting a little angry no doubt i have been very foolish perhaps presumptuous still he was in love with this girl and he felt sure that it was owing to his own clumsiness that the conversation had been so unsatisfactory he did not believe could not that eleanor could really care for a woman he felt to be vulgar if not immoral perhaps in a thoughtless moment she had invited her to her father's house but he did not believe eleanor was really influenced by her of course he knew she held somewhat advanced views but so did lots of other girls he knew and he was so much in love with her that he had not paid them serious attention he determined he would make one more try and again he took the wrong course miss trelawney he said after they had walked some distance in silence i'm sure you can't mean it mean what what you said what did i say that miss cory was your dearest friend but i do say it she is my dearest friend and do you believe as she believes about what why all that wild talk about women and marriage 
i don't blindly follow any one but in the main i agree with her personally i hate the thought of marriage how any self-respecting woman can consent to become the chattel of a man to give her life to a man is beyond me the whole thought is disgusting eleanor had said more than she meant far more than she believed but she did not have her usual control over herself the decision she had made that day affected her more than she had realized in her heart of hearts eleanor knew that her father was right and yet so much had she been influenced by the people with whom she had met that she determined to fight her battle to the last after listening much to a certain class of women she half believed in what they said and so fully had she accepted their views about what they called women's inalienable right to liberty that it had become a sort of passion with her in a sense only a part of the girl's nature was aroused on the intellectual side she was fully developed but she had not realized her womanhood as a child she had never been fond of dolls and had never been fully conscious of what for want of a better word may be termed the maternal side of her nature like many girls of her age she was somewhat of a revolutionist by nature and owing to a lack of strong guiding influences in her home life and moved to admiration of what she called the unconventionality of the women she had met she was unbalanced added to all this was the fact that religious influences had been largely eliminated the advanced women she had met spoke of religion as an unnatural restriction of human liberty and this fact had determined her to oppose her father if he should attempt to use parental authority she was not what might be called an affectionate girl and yet in a way she could not understand she hungered for affection she professed to scorn marriage and yet in spite of the fact that she was angry with peggy for her infatuation for barnes she aided and abetted her in her disobedience to her father and although she despised barnes she almost envied her sister you are serious in this miss trelawney asked ravenscroft after a somewhat painful silence perfectly serious but i am mistaken please forgive me had i known that i would not of course have bothered you neither will i tell you what what i longed to tell you you would not understand it it would have been too too sacred for you to comprehend my eyes are opened now and and of course i'm tremendously sorry after that they talked on the merest commonplaces until they reached colonel trelawney's house won't you come in and speak to mother she asked no thank you it's nearly dinner-time and my people will be expecting me good evening eleanor trelawney went straight into her own room nervous irritable and low-spirited she could not understand she was disappointed angry with herself she had been true to what she called her convictions but she was not satisfied she felt sure she knew what rod ravenscroft had meant to say to her and the thought brought a feeling to her heart akin to pain there was something else too something wonderful indefinable then her mind flew back to the experiences of the previous sunday night and her father's imperative command that she should see no more of such women as tamsin cory she remembered too what she had done that day and wondered if she had done right yes she did admire her father and in her heart of hearts she knew that he was only doing what was right after all she herself had often felt uncomfortable at the talk of the advanced women 
perhaps had colonel trelawney come into the room at that moment eleanor's life story might have been different in a way she could not understand she longed for affection longed for loving advice and guidance did rod ravenscroft care for her was that what he meant her heart beat faster at the thought and yet no she hated the idea of marriage and she would be free to live her own life no matter what her father might say dinner was to be late that evening colonel trelawney had phoned that he could not get home till after eight o'clock and she found herself dressed and ready before the bell rang peg where have you been she asked as she heard her sister's footsteps outside the door i'll tell you after dinner there his serene highness has arrived he's talking with the pattern boy eleanor was quite calm as presently she met the family at dinner and as her father seemed very cold and stern the influences of the day seemed to harden i'm going to spend to-morrow with trev remarked the colonel presently he has to go to ireland on friday so i must leave london to-night i want to get to plymouth early so that i can have the whole day with him when will you get back dear asked mrs trelawney i shall leave plymouth on friday was his reply but i have to see some men at the war office directly i get back fancy two whole nights sighed mrs trelawney yes two whole nights laughed the colonel but that's not much after several years absence i hate your going away though i don't think the war office is fair you ought to have had at least a month's freedom after all you've done i shall soon get it now replied the colonel of course there were a lot of things that had to be settled but i'm nearly through with them and of course i have to see trev couldn't i go with you asked mrs trelawney i want to see him too the colonel was on the point of answering in the affirmative but at that moment he saw the look in peggy's eyes i wish i could say yes he replied but i think you'll have to stay home however pleasant it might be it wouldn't be wise do you think the house would run away if mother weren't here asked eleanor i think it will be safer if she is here to take care of it replied the colonel gravely and that reminds me of course you remember our conversation on sunday night we are not likely to forget it replied the girl just so i've had rather an unpleasant reminder of it this evening as i shall have to be leaving shortly i want to say that i trust to your honour to see that my wishes are obeyed whose honour asked peggy the honour of both you girls the decision i came to on sunday has been confirmed especially to-day you mean that i'm not to see jim you are not to see that man barnes neither are you to hold any communication with him whatever peggy was silent i must confess to a grievous disappointment went on the colonel in spite of what i said on sunday i find that you have been again meeting this man yes and i mean to was the defiant reply then you know that he asked for an interview with me yes i never promised i wouldn't see him i'm engaged to him and of course i told him all you said you realize that this is open defiance and disobedience of course i do well i've seen him and i've forbidden him to speak to you or see you again if he disobeys me i shall have to take stern methods i'm sorry to have to say this but you have compelled me and does this also apply to my friends asked eleanor to those of the miss cory order yes was the father's reply as for such friends as your mother approves of i will gladly welcome them come now children you may think me hard but you'll thank me some day i'm only acting in love and for your good 
perhaps his closing words were not wise if there is anything which present-day girls resent it is to be told that something is being done for their good in any case neither of them replied and as the colonel had to leave them in order to make preparations for his journey they went away together john my boy confided the colonel just before his departure i feel anything but happy in going away nothing would have induced me to leave home just now but the fact that i shall have no other opportunity of seeing trev for some weeks he had told john of what had passed between barnes and himself and had expressed a stronger dislike to him than before yes it is awkward assented john however the thing was bound to come to a head went on the colonel and one can't live in a state of uncertainty we can either trust them or we can't john was silent anyhow i shall be staying at the duke of cornwall hotel you must telephone me if anything happens all right dad and and you'll do all you can my boy yes all i can that's right my son good night good night dad come back as soon as you can he's a good lad reflected the colonel as the cornish express swept westward thank god for him end of chapter eleven